We're starting a new series today called A Season of Miracles. So let's go to Matthew chapter 1, verse 18 to 25. And it says this, this is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother, Mary, was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. And he, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. And all of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child, she will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And when Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded, and he took Mary as his wife, but he did not have sexual relations with her until she, her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. Let's pray. God, over these next few moments, Lord, I pray, God, that you speak to our hearts, Lord. Father, I step back so that you can step forward. Lord, I decrease so that you can increase. Lord, I pray that today, God, that you would confirm, that you would validate this message through the, through the working of signs, wonders, and miracles, Lord. Let there be miracles in the house today, God. Father, as we speak on the season of miracles, let, a, let the miracle, Father, let a miracle be manifested in our house today, God. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody says, amen. Before you see, uh, see the look at your neighbor and say, you look great this morning. Amen. Praise God. Some of you said that with a little bit extra juice on there. Like some of you look at your spouse, you're like, you look great. Calm, so calm down, calm down. Praise God. <clears throat> Here we are, church, at the end. We are less than a month away, right, from the end of 2022. It seems like it just started. It seems like it was it just yesterday where we, we, we launched the year of victory. That was, that's been our theme for the year, right? It's the year of victory. And so, and so I joked with my wife, and, and I remember as the summer started, as we were in the middle of June, and I told Rosie, I said, can you believe that we're almost six months away from Christmas and she laughed at me and here we are right we're in this Christmas season right and it's it's upon us it's a time to celebrate right it's a time to gather with family and friends and it's a time of great joy but I would be remiss if I weren't honest with you and, and tell you that for many people it's it's not a great season of joy that that the Christmas season that the Thanksgiving season it brings up a lot of stuff it brings up a lot of memories it brings up it brings up stuff stuff comes to the surface and so while for many of us right we celebrate and and and, and we it's a time of great joy but but to be honest for a lot of people it's a difficult time it's a season where they have to face face the loss of a loved one right face the, the reality of a job loss or, or, or maybe changes in their economic situation or, or maybe emotionally they're just not where they want to be. And so, so these, these holidays, it's, it's kind of like it's a two-edged sword. In one way, it's really good, but in another way, it's, it's really challenging, right? And there's, there's so many reasons to celebrate with family and friends, but there are those who struggle with, with loneliness and in anxiety and, and insecurity, Right? They're in a moment of crisis, in a, in a moment of need. But I want us to think for just a moment, go back to the, the Christmas story. Go back to, to the story of, of Joseph and Mary. And imagine how this young lady Mary must have been feeling. We, many, many of us already know the story, but let's just, let's just rethink this for just a moment. Let's take a moment to think about how Mary must have been feeling at that that day, that moment, right? Here we have this, this young lady, this young woman who's expecting to start her new life with her fiancé when all of a sudden the unexpected happens. And I would say that describing it as unexpected is putting it mildly. I would say it's more than unexpected. It's unreal. Think about this for just a moment. Here you are, you're a young lady, 
for those of you who are ladies, and you go to bed one night, one night you go to bed expecting to be married soon to your fiancé, you're excited about your new life, and the next morning you wake up pregnant. That's not only unexpected, that's unreal. You haven't been with a man, you haven't been with your fiancé, you're not married yet, but yet now someone is growing inside you. A child is growing inside you. So it's not just unexpected, it's unreal. And not only is it unreal, it's just, it just blows your mind because it's not just any child. You're not just having a baby. You're not just having a son. You're having the son of God, the creator of the universe, the creator of everything that we see. Come on. It, now, all of a sudden, you're not just carrying a child. You're carrying the child, the son of God. So it's not just unexpected. It's unreal. Like, it's unreal. It blows her mind. And now, watch, all of a sudden, this life that she had planned out, this life that she was expecting, now it takes a turn. She becomes pregnant by supernatural means and she's tasked by God himself, listen, to give birth to the Messiah, the Son of God. And as if that weren't enough pressure to deal with, that would be enough for anybody, right? I mean, think about that. You're going to carry the Son of God. If that weren't enough to deal with, now all of a sudden she has to deal with the consequences of this unexpected, unreal pregnancy. See, we, we, don't, we don't fully grasp that today. And our culture, but the culture of that day, I mean, it was, it was a huge, huge disgrace for a woman to come out pregnant, right, before she was married. And especially, it wasn't even her fiancé's baby. Huge disgrace. And so now she has to, dis to deal with the ramifications of this unexpected, this unreal pregnancy. And her reputation takes a hit in the community. Imagine now Mary Mar uh, walks through the marketplace and she has to hear all the chatter. There goes Mary. Can you believe what she did to Joseph? She says she's pregnant by the Spirit of God. She's not only pregnant, she's crazy. She has to explain this pregnancy to her parents. Mary, how could you shame our family name? Father, I can only imagine the conversation. Father, please, you don't understand. This is of God. You're crazy, Mary. You've, you've tarnished our family name. Imagine the conversation she has with Joseph. Joseph, I've been loyal to you. I haven't done anything. I promise to you, this is of God. And Joseph pushes her away and ends the, the marriage, the engagement, right, quietly. She faces the possibility now of being a single parent in that culture, in that society, having to raise a child alone. It was a great it was a great time of need for her, wasn't it? I mean, think about that for just a moment. Mary, Mary, Mary. some people could say, was, was never alone in that process, right? She was never alone in that, that time, in that moment of great need. But here's what I want us all to look at very clearly, is that remember that every miracle, every miracle that has ever happened shares one thing in common. Every miracle starts with a need. So if you're here today and there's a need in your life, then there's a possibility of a miracle. And so here she is, Mary, facing this moment, this great need in her life, but it was just a setup for a miracle. And if there's a need in your life, no matter how big or small, remember that every miracle starts with a need. See, in, in, this, in this Christmas season, it's a season that's filled with so many miracles, that's why I've called this series, right, The Season of Miracles, because it's, it's a time where, where we can, you can choose to focus on the problem, or you can choose to focus on the miracle. You can, you can ch choose to focus on the crisis, or you can choose to focus on the miracle. You can choose to focus on the need in your life, or you can choose to focus on the miracle. And here at Lifeway, I want you to focus on the miracle. Everybody say miracle. Everybody say there's a miracle 
Come on, say, there's a miracle in my house. Praise God. Now listen to this. I want us to talk about Joseph today. And I want us to talk about the, the miracle that occurred in his life and through his life. Did you hear me? It's not just, watch, there's a miracle that occurred in his life, but there's also a miracle that occurred through his life. Watch. What do we know about Joseph? All right? Let's look at the life of Joseph based on the scriptures that we just read. Here's what we know about Joseph. Number one, he was a righteous man. Everybody say righteous. That means he was a good man. He was a man that had a good reputation in the community. He was a hard worker. He was, he was a provider. He was a, he was a man of integrity. He was a good man. In fact, the Bible tells us that Joseph was a direct descendant from King David. So Joseph, right, came from royal lineage. He had a good reputation, a good name, a good, you know, a, a, a good name in the, in the community. The Bible says that he was a righteous man, a good man. Number two, the Bible tells us that he was a compassionate man. Everybody say compassionate. See, the Bible says that when he found out that Mary was pregnant, the Bible says that he didn't look to shame her publicly. He didn't look for revenge. He wasn't looking for her to ridicule her or to shame her publicly. It says that he wanted to, he, he, he terminated the engagement, but he did it quietly. He wasn't trying to call her out. He wasn't trying to put her in, her, in any danger. He just did it quietly. This shows the compassionate side of this man. Another man may have done something different. He may have gotten angry. He may have wanted revenge. He may have wanted to shame her. In that culture, she had, according to the law, she could have been killed. But he did it quietly, so that shows that he was a compassionate man. The Bible also tells us that he was a thoughtful man. Everybody say thoughtful. In other words, he considered the events. That after everything happened, he went home and he thought on them. He considered them. He pondered them. He was careful not to rush to conclusions. And finally, the Bible tells us that he was an obedient man. Everybody say obedient. That once God revealed himself in a dream and told him what to do, the Bible says that he followed the direction given to him in a dream. So what do we know about Joseph? We know that he was righteous. He was compassionate. He was thoughtful. He was obedient. So I want us to look at his life. And I, in fact, I want us to look at these, these scriptures that we just read. And I want us to see the miracle that happened in him, but also the miracle that happened through him. Here's, here's the first thing I would have you consider. Point number one is this, is that Joseph experienced a miracle through an encounter. The Bible says in verse 20, it says, as he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Do you want to know when the miracle started? The miracle started the moment he had an encounter with God. See, many of you here today, you're, you're believing for a miracle in your life. You're believing for a miracle in certain aspects of your life, in your, in your marriage or your family or, or, or your finances or your, your health or, or whatever area that is. You're believing, you're saying, God, God, I need a miracle. I'm here to tell you that the, your miracle starts the moment you have an encounter with God. That the moment that you come into contact with God, everything, everything, everything has to change. That you can't come into contact with God and stay the same. That your situation can't stay the same. That your thoughts can't stay the same. That your attitude can't stay the same. That your health can't stay the same. That your mindset can't stay the same. That the moment that you come into contact with the living God, come on somebody, that is the beginning of your miracle. Joseph's miracle started the moment he had an encounter with God. See, many people think that, oh, I can encounter religion. Religion will never change you. Religion will just bind you. Well, if I could just encounter this, if I could, if I could just connect with this person, or if I could just have this relationship, or if this person would love me back the way I love them, or if I could just have this thing, or if I could have this possession, if I could have this house, or if I could have this in my life, and we think that that is going to change us, but see, those things are external things. The change that we really desire and the change that we really need is internal. And only God can change the inside. 
You're carrying a burden. You're carrying a weight. You're carrying a heaviness on you. There's a load that you've been carrying and it weighs on you and it's weighing you down and it's cumbersome and it's heavy and it weighs on your thoughts and it weighs on your peace of mind and, and it fills your life with anxiety and, and it fills your life with just this hopelessness. And here's the thing is mi- Joseph's miracle started the moment he had an encounter with God. The Bible says that he considered the things that were happening and it says that an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream you see Joseph had an encounter with 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 heaven Joseph had an encounter with the God of heaven Joseph had an encounter with God everything changes religion won't change me come on my fears my fears won't 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 release me won't set me free Joseph was in the midst of a crisis. Joseph was in the midst of, 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 of a situation in his life. He was, he was, he was expecting to be married. He, 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 had, he had done all the preparations for his bride in that, in that culture. It wasn't, it wasn't like as if when you got engaged, it wasn't like, oh, okay, we're going to get married in a week or two. No, it, for that, in that culture, it was, it was a year of preparation. It was, it was many months of preparation. The, the, the man had to get the home ready and, and have a place for her to live and, and, and get ready to be able to sustain her and take care of her and, and get everything lined up so that when they got married, she would be taken care of. And so all this preparation had gone, had gone into, into the marriage, and now all of a sudden, it's out the window. His bride, his home, his future has come crashing down because of this unexpected, unrealistic pregnancy. He didn't rush to condemn Mary. But he wasn't sure what to do. Have you ever found yourself in a situation like that where like something happens, you didn't ask for it to happen, you didn't expect it to happen, but something happens to you and now you find yourself just like Joseph and you don't know what to do and you're like, what do I do? I need need something. I need direction. I need a miracle from God. That's where Joseph was. But in his time of need, He discovered the will of God through a dream. He discovered the will of God through an encounter with heaven. He discovered the will of God by having an encounter with God. You know, I think of people who had encounters with God in Scripture. I think of of Moses. Moses, who had an encounter with God at the burning bush, how his life was changed. I think of Elisha who had an encounter with God through the prophet Elijah, excuse me, Elisha had an encounter with God through the prophet Elijah, his mentor. I think about the apostle Paul, who had an encounter with with, with Jesus on the road to Damascus, how all these lives were changed. Here's what I want you to know today, is that everything that you are looking for today, everything that your heart desires, all the crisis that you're trying to overcome, all the issues, all the brokenness, and let's not make any mistake about it, on some level, everyone in this room is broken. Right? Like, we don't all have it all together. I'm good. No, no, uh, you may be good, right? But something, something's amiss somewhere. That's our humanity. There's a need, there's a crisis, there's a problem, there's a trial. It may not be significant, it may be significant. I don't know what you're going through today, but humanity has, every, has one thing in common, we're all broken. The, the, the fact is, is that we all hide it differently. We mask it. We, we cover it up. We, we put a facade on it. All right? What's a facade? It's, it's something that's, that's meant to cover up the interior. So while we may be smiling and while we may be laughing, on the inside, we're broken. We're hurting. That's just the nature of humanity. Watch. Here's the beautiful thing about God is I can allow that brokenness, watch, listen, I can allow that brokenness to draw me to God or I can allow it to push me away from Him. And so watch, how, what you decide today will determine if you get healed or you don't. You can continue to walk in your brokenness 
and separation from God. Or you can, you can allow that brokenness to bring humility and it draws you to God. And so watch, here he is. And what does Joseph need? Joseph needs an encounter with God. That's his miracle. Your miracle starts with an encounter with God. Your miracle starts with encountering the presence of God. As we just sang earlier in our worship set, everything is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. He's turning my mourning into dancing, my sorrow into joy. Everything is changing now because when he walks into the room, nothing's ever the same. It's not, those, are not just, those are not just words on a screen. That, that, is, that is what happens when we come into contact with the living God. And so now all of a sudden Joseph has this encounter with God. And because he has this encounter with God, three things happen into his, in his life. Number one, Joseph's soul was settled. Everybody say settled. He had no fear, no trepidation. Have you ever been unsettled? What happens to your life when you're unsettled? I know what happens in my life when I'm unsettled. When I'm unsettled about something, my whole body becomes unsettled. No, I'm serious. Like, my body starts hurting, my stomach starts hurting, my head starts hurting, my back's like, hey. why? Because my, my spirit, my soul is unsettled, and the thing that's happening in my soul then begins to affect my body. Some of you, listen to this, some of you, you've been thinking you need a physical miracle. It's not a physical miracle you need. You need a spiritual one. You need an emotional one. You've been emotionally unsettled about things in your life. And it's twisted you on the inside, your emotions, and those things have affected your body. Come on. Because you've been unsettled, what do you do? You run to an addiction, come on, to settle the anxiety. To settle the pain, to settle the worry or the fear. So you've, so you've taken an addiction, right? Whether it be to a drug or alcohol or whatever it is, right? You take that addiction and you use it to quelch the unsettledness in your heart. You're lonely. You're lonely. You need things in your life. And so watch, some of you, you're so unsettled relationally, right? And, 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 and physically, watch, many people, they run to pornography, to settle themselves sexually, and guess what? You're actually more unsettled. Come on. Getting real now, huh? I thought this was a Christmas message. <laughs> I, I, we didn't know we were talking about pornography at church today. <laughs> I missed the memo. I'm, I'm talking about how unsettled you are. You're unsettled, right? You're unsettled in your heart, and so because you're unsettled, watch, it affects you relationally, spiritually mentally physically there's so many areas and so watch when 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 joseph was unsettled about the situation he had an encounter with god follow me here and now all of a sudden what was unsettled becomes settled some of you just want the thoughts to stop some of you are like i just wish my mind would stop I wish that I could quit thinking about the issue. I wish that I would quit replaying the hurt and the pain. I wish that I could just overcome this addiction. I wish, I wish, I wish. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to wish anymore. Because one encounter with God settles the unsettled. It does. One encounter with God may not change your situation, but one encounter with God will change you. God's more interested about changing you than he is about changing your situation. Because what good is it if he changes the situation and you're not changed? Guess what's going to happen? The situation is going to go back to where it was at before. Come on, somebody. He has this encounter with God and now all of a sudden his soul becomes settled. Number two, Joseph receives direction on how to move forward. Some of us were in a state of paralysis. We're in a state of paralysis because we don't know what to do. You want to know why? Because we're analyzing everything too much. It's called the paralysis of analysis. It's true. That's a term that's used 
in, in, in the corporate world, in, the, in, in, in leadership. It's the paralysis of analysis, right? Is that when you're, you're too busy analyzing everything and there's option A and B and C and D and E and F and you, and you don't make a decision because you've got all these options and you're trying to figure one out. And instead of just relying on God, you're trying to make the way. And that's why you haven't acted. You haven't acted in faith in your marriage. You haven't acted in faith in your finances. You haven't acted in faith in your family. You haven't acted in faith in your spiritual walk with God because you've been idle. You're stuck. You're stuck in a rut. But when you have an encounter with God, He gives you direction. He says, do this. Go this way. And I, and I would say this about, about what I'm giving you here. It's a progression. In other words, watch, the first thing you need to do before you choose what to do, you got to settle yourself. And then once you're settled, then God can say, okay, now do this. And which leads to the third thing is that he found the courage to walk in his assignment. Please hear me. Hear me when I say this. This was, God was not telling him, God was not telling Joseph, Mary. Stay married or get married to Mary. Go through the marriage. He wasn't telling him just that. It was more than the marriage. His assignment was the son. His the assignment was Mary and the son. Because what does he tell Joseph? He says to Joseph, Joseph, that baby that she's carrying, it is of supernatural means. And guess what? You're going to name him. You're going to name him Jesus. And the Bible says at the end of verse 25, and he named him in other words, you know what he was doing? He was assuming the role of a father. He didn't let Mary name him. It was the role of the dad to name the child. Why? Because the father, the fa see, this is why we need fathers. Pause for a moment. See, for a moment. Good, good, good night. Can I be honest with you? We need men to be fathers. You want to know what fathers do? Fathers... Fathers look at their children and they set the direction of their child. They said, this is who you're going to go. This is where you're going to be. This is the direction you're going. In. That's what dads do. That's what godly dads do. Come, oh, that's my, that's my. Siri is talking. Jesus, I'm going to put this down. Sorry, sorry, church. Even Siri wants some of Jesus. Come on, somebody. I don't know what to say. I didn't, I didn't activate her. <laughs> he took on that responsibility. He took on that role. And what is, he becomes a father. Now watch, that was his assignment. His assignment was to be husband. His assignment was to be father. But here's what he needed. He, 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 number one, he needed to settle himself. Number two, he needed the direction. But here's what he really needed. And this is where many of you are at right now. You're, you know what God has told you to do. You know what you, the steps you're supposed to take in your finances, in your marriage, in your family, whatever the case may be. But here's what, what you need. You need the courage to do it. Right? Like some of you, some of you, you, you know God has called you to witness to your coworker, but you don't have the courage to do it. Some of you know that you're going to have to you're going to have to make some changes in your family. You're going to have to make some changes to your marriage. You're going to have to make some changes to your, yourself, to your attitude. Some of you, you know that your thinking is wrong. You're going to have to have the courage to step through what God's called you to step through. You want to know where you find that courage? You find that courage in the presence of God. When I, what, what, <laughs> I, I remember seeing this picture recently. And, and it was it was uh, it was a picture of a lamb. I think it was a lamb, or it was a little kitten. It may be in a little kitten. This is us going into the presence of God. You know, a little nice small kitten. And when we come out, we come out like a roaring lion, right? It may have been a lamb. I don't know. I'm gonna say a kitten. All right, it's cuter, <laughs> right? Some of us have you ever have you ever been to, come to church? Have you ever come to church? And when we come, you just there was you were unsettled. And then praise and worship and then the message. And you come out of here like, that's right, I know what I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden you get to the car and you become a kitten again. You get to the house and now all of a sudden, you know, instead of the roaring lion, 
You're like a pew, pew. A roar, from a roar to a whimper. You don't have the courage to step into what, what God has called you to do. Hmm? Courage to make changes in your family. Courage to make changes in your attitude. Courage to say, God, I'm going to step into that. God, I'm going to step into that. Whatever it is, Lord, I know what you've got. Some of you, you've been struggling with that, and that's why you're so miserable. Because you know what God's asked you to do, and you're not doing it. Why aren't you doing it? I don't know. Well, then get in more into the presence of God. Press in. Lean in. Find your strength in his presence. That was the miracle. The miracle. The miracle of Emmanuel. Right? The miracle of Emmanuel. God with us. God with us in our crisis. God with us in our trouble. God with us in the valley low. God with us in our victory. God with us in our breakthrough. God with us. It's a beautiful miracle. It changes us. So he experienced this miracle, right? It was the presence of God. It was, it was an encounter with God, which then it leads us to the, to the next miracle, right? Which is God now takes Joseph, and now there's a shift. He goes from experiencing a miracle. Watch. Everybody listen, because this is where God wants to take every one of us in this room. He wants to take us from experiencing a miracle to becoming a miracle. I've experienced a miracle. Praise God. But now Joseph, God used Joseph to serve as a miracle for Mary. Listen to what it says in verse 24. When Joseph woke up, everybody say, Woke up. See, see, watch. God will never use you, never use you to be a miracle until you wake up. Some of you need to be spiritually awake, You're woken up. Wake up. Come alive. No more slumber. No more sleep. Wake up. But the enemy has rocked you to sleep. Some of you are right there, and the enemy has rocked you, and he's going, you've got into a spiritual hammock, and you've been, you've been rocked to sleep. Wake up. It says that he woke up, watch this, and he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. Here's, here's the miracle right here. It says, and he took Mary as his wife. Now, you look at that phrase, and he took Mary as his wife, and you say, oh, that's not a miracle. It is a miracle. It absolutely is a miracle. You're not looking at it right. You got to remember, right? She's now pregnant. Her name is tarnished in the community. She's got a reputation. He had no obligation to her. He could have gone and moved on. The miracle was is that he took her as his wife. You see, it doesn't sound like much, but when you really look at that statement and what it means, you begin, you begin to understand the, the enormity, the power of this miracle. Because without Joseph, listen, listen to this, without Joseph, Mary would have had no one to provide for her, protect her, or care for her during her pregnancy. And some people would jump and say, no, no, she would have. She would have had God. God would have provided. Yes, I 100% agree with that. But listen, every Everything that God chooses to do on this earth, he chooses to do it through people. It's a partnership. When God wanted to name the animals, he said, Adam, you name them. You think God couldn't have named the animals in the Garden of Eden? But he says, Adam, you do it. When God wanted to rescue humanity and start all over, do you think that he couldn't have just created a new Adam, a new person? No, but he, create, he partnered with Noah to create an ark. Come on, somebody, to start humanity all over again. When he heard the cries of his people that were in captivity, do you think that God himself could have just annihilated Pharaoh and the Egyptians and, let, and, and just let the people take the land that they were in? No. What did he do? He says, I'm going to choose Moses. When he wanted to build a nation, do you think that he could have just built a nation? No, but what did he do? He chose a king by the name of David, come on, to build a nation. 
Do you think that God could have, have, have just wiped out all the false prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 19? He could have done it, just give the word. But he chose to partner with a prophet by the name of Elijah. Come on, somebody. Do you think that God could have just erased all of our sin just like that? No, he could have done it just like that. But he says, I'm going to partner with the man. Not just any man. I'm going to partner with the son of God, the son of man, Jesus. And Jesus came down. Come on. Do you think that God, come on, could have, could have just healed people? No, but he used the prophets and he used the apostles in the New Testament to heal people. Why? Because God does miracles through people. So don't come to it. Well, God would have been with Mary. God was with Mary, but he used Joseph to be that miracle. We, we look at Joseph. We don't think he's a miracle. Joseph was a huge miracle. Huge miracle. Because he says, I'm going to assume that responsibility. I'm going res- to assume that responsibility, right? And now all of a sudden goes from experiencing a miracle to becoming a miracle. Think on this for just a moment. When Joseph took Mary on as his wife, he assumed the responsibility to provide for her. Listen, you don't have to worry about shelter. You don't have to worry about food. You don't have to worry about necessities. You, you, you know, I've got you, Mary. We, see, we don't understand what it is to be provided for until we need provided for. Right? Early on in life, when you're a child, what happens? You gotta, you gotta take care of that baby. You gotta feed it. You gotta clothe it. You gotta house it. You gotta take care of it. They grow up a little bit. They still need clothing and housing. And they grow up a little bit more. Now they need insurance. <laughs> they still don't know how to clothe themselves sometimes. Come on, somebody. They don't know how to feed themselves. They go to the refrigerator, and there's nothing to eat. What are you talking about? There's cold cuts, and there's snacks. Did you look at the pantry? There's nothing there. You go, and then you pull it out. Oh, I didn't see that. See? You don't know what it is to be provided until you need to be provided for. You get older on in life, and I want to tell all the kids, just remember how your parents took care of you, because you're going to take care of your kids like that, too. Your parents. Micah, you're going to take care of me, son. Georgian, Jared, take care of us. Remember how many times we took you to Disneyland and Disney World and bought you nice stuff. You can take care of us. I expect a trip to Switzerland very soon. <laughs> freely you received, freely you give. He took on that responsibility. He, he provided for her. He, he protected her. He, he, he said, listen, I know they're talking about you, Mary, but they're going to have to come through me. I know that they're saying things about you, but don't worry. I'm with you. I'll protect you. Mary, I know that you're pregnant, and, and, and I know you're, you're with child. You're carrying the Son of God. And, 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 and now, Mary, I know you're, you're, you're kind of you're getting in your, your, your second trimester, your last trimester. And right for those of us who, who've had the blessing of having a wife who's pregnant, we understand that sometimes you know, the challenges of pregnancy, right, physically on our wife, they require our help. And I remember there were times when with Rosie, her, her feet would, would, they would just get blessed. You know, they would, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? They just, just, it's like, they'd well up with joy. Come on, somebody. And so, so what do you do? So, so there Joseph was, Mary sit down and, 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 you know, massaging her feet and massaging her back and, you know, my back's hurting. Okay. And I imagine this is the kind of man that he was. Oh, you're, you're reading in too much. No, because it says he was a righteous man. That he was a compassionate man. Yeah, I'd never do that. You got issues then. You treat your wife like a queen, she'll treat you like a king. That's free. You say, why is your pastor, why are you always so happy? I'm right there. Because I treat her. I honor her. I respect her. I I take care of her. That doesn't mean I don't make mistakes. Doesn't mean I fall short. What do you mean that's right? Who said that? No, I'm playing. I'm joking. I'm joking. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I'm joking. He cared for her. Watch. 
we, we, we overlook that. We, oh, that's not a big deal. Can I, can I break down this miracle for you simply? Let me put it real simple. Right here it is. The miracle was simply this, that God put Joseph in Mary's life so that she wouldn't have to go through her pregnancy and life alone. Here's something for you to consider, contemplate. God never intended you to go through life alone. And I'm not talking about spouse. Some of you go, I'm not married. I don't got okay, fair enough. But I'm not talking about a spouse necessarily. Do you know that God didn't call you to be a lone ranger? Even the lone ranger had Tonto. I never understood why they called him Tonto. Because in Spanish, it's Tonto. Poor Tonto. He never, he never called you to be a, 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 an isolated island unto yourself. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says in Genesis 2.18, and I know this isn't the context of Adam and Eve, but the principle applies to so much more. It says, it is not good for a man to be alone. In other words, come on, nothing good happens when you're alone. The only time you're called to be alone in Scripture is to be alone, and not even, even that moment are you alone, because you're supposed to be alone with God. Because when you're alone, you're weak. When you're alone, you're vulnerable. When you're alone, you get depressed. When you're alone, you make bad decisions. When you're alone, the enemy attacks your mind. Come on. When you're alone, you battle that addiction. When you're alone, all of a sudden, all this stuff comes to the surface. But that's why the Bible says it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, I understand that he said that in the context of a husband and wife. But the principle is that you're never alone. So guess what? So if you're not married, guess what God puts in your life? He puts brothers and sisters. He puts people of faith around you. This is why the Bible, he, here's another word for it. He puts friends. Proverbs 18, verse 24, it says this, For there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. This is why it's important for us to recognize and ask ourselves, do we have the right friends in our life? The right friends will encourage us when we're down. The right friends will stand with us in crisis and adversity. The right friends will lift us when we fall. And the right friends will pray with us when we need answers. The right friends will speak truth and love. Listen, listen, and not enable bad behavior. The right friends will exercise love in us and for us no matter what. See? See? This is why, everybody listen to me, this is why the church is so important. Because the church is not a building that we go to. It's not even a service that we attend. The church, listen to this, is a family. Everybody say family. You know what? You want to know what church is? Church, since I just came back from Hawaii, is Ohana. It's family. And in the immortal words of Stitch, family doesn't get left behind. So you want to know something? People aren't looking for a church. People aren't looking for a church. People are looking for a family. Right? See, see this is going to be, I'm going to pause for a moment and speak to all our church family. That, that this is your church. This is going to be our challenge when we get to the new building. Because right now we're all, we, we got this all oh, nice and cozy and we know everybody and oh, it feels so good. But what happens when there's double the amount of people? And people go, oh, it doesn't feel like it used to. It doesn't feel like it because you didn't make it feel like it. The bigger we get, the smaller we get. What do you mean the smaller we get? That's right. The bigger we get, the smaller we get. How do we get smaller? Life groups. You're pretty sly, Pastor. You, you we worked that in there. No, it's true. You got People aren't looking for a church. They're looking for a family. Where do you get that family feel? This, you know what happens on Sunday morning? This is family reunion. This is family reunion. But our families meet on Monday nights, Tuesday nights, Wednesday mornings, Thursday nights, Friday nights, Saturdays. That's when family meets. 
get together with your family. Some of you, you eat a little food. Some of you eat a little more than food. Come on, somebody. You, have, you talk together. You pray. Why? Because that's family. That's what families do. This is why the Apostle Paul said in Hebrews 10, he goes, don't forsake, don't neglect coming together to church in the service. Family reunion, families get together. How's it going? How's your week been? You talk to each other outside. You, you mingle, right? You, you mingle, you talk, you, you, you share, you get into that family group, that life group that we call it, right? This is why this is important. This is why we open up the sanctuary every Saturday morning at 9 o'clock for prayer. So the family can come together, and as a family, we talk to our Heavenly Father. The family comes together to approach the Father. This is why in the month of January, we will have prayer meetings like we do every year. If you're new to LifeWay, we have prayer meetings on Monday night, Tuesday night. We have leadership prayer meetings on Wednesday night, Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday morning. And then we have church. You're like, oh my God, seven days a week? That's family. You don't stop being my brother on Tuesday. And we come together and we, we petition Abba Father, Daddy, God, our dad. We pray. We worship together. We celebrate together. We pray together. Watch. We cry together. We come together to see God move. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on up. We we petition God. We, we lean into the presence of God together, right? I want to I just ask you three questions today as we, as, we, as we close. Here it is. Three closing questions for you to consider. Here's number one. Are you aware that God wants to have an encounter with you? I, I don't want an emotional encounter. I want a, a God encounter. I don't want a religious encounter. I want a God encounter. I want a God encounter. I want an encounter where I won't be the same. That when I met with God, that my life has changed. I, I remember that moment in my life when I encountered the presence of God for the first time. It forever forever changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life. I can pinpoint moments where I've had supernatural God encounters with God. I can, I can talk about how every Sunday and every Wednesday and, and every time that we worship together, how God begins to minister to me and God begins to change me in some fashion or form. Are you aware today that God, the God of the universe, wants an encounter with you? Why is that important? Because one encounter can change everything. That's it. Your addiction is broken in one encounter with God. Your depression is broken in one encounter with God. Your anger is lifted in one encounter with God. Your sorrow goes to joy with one encounter with God. Here's the second question. Who has been that miracle in your life? Like Joseph was a miracle to Mary's life. Who's been that miracle in your life? Who's been with you through thick and thin? Come on. Here's what I would have you do today. Is, is, as I'm saying this, you're, you're, you're thinking about that person. You're thinking about that friend or, or maybe a family member or maybe someone in the church. Who's been that person? That's, and you're thinking about them. You know what you should do today before we leave? You should first of all say, God, thank you. For this miracle. I didn't see them as a miracle, but they've been a miracle. Bobby, you've been a miracle in my life. Stacy and Corey, you've been a miracle in my life. James and Anita, you've been a miracle in my life. Sweetheart, you know that you're the number one miracle in my life. You've been many of you have been a miracle in my life. And I'm blessed because of it. And I thank God because you've been a miracle in my life. And I could name so many people, and I don't have time to name everybody but so many miracles in my life so here's my question is is it who's been a miracle in your life you should thank God for them but I want you to go a step further I want you to tell them today take a moment today to go find that person and just say hey I want you to know you've been a miracle in my life and here's the last question are you ready to be a miracle in someone's life today 
Are you ready to be that miracle for someone this week, this month? That just as Joseph experienced a miracle, he became a miracle for Mary. And just as you've experienced a miracle in your life, you can be a miracle for someone's life today. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. We hope you're blessed by today's video. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and follow our social media platforms in the description below. God bless.